Hello, welcome to our class, Heterogeneous Computing. Today, I'm going to talk about OpenCL examples. This is the first of the three sessions that we will use OpenCL examples to show you how to solve the problems using OpenCL programming. In today's lecture, we're going to look at three examples, matrix multiplication, image rotation, and image convolution. And for each of these three examples, we'll show you through demonstrations how the OpenCL program is designed, compiled, and executed. Matrix multiplication is a very classical parallel computing example that have been used in many different occasions. Here we have two input matrices, A and B. For each of these two matrices, it has certain number of rows and certain number of columns. Uh, for matrix A, we have a number of rows which we denote as height of A, HA. For the number of columns, we denote with WA, or width of A. Similarly, we denote the number of rows for B is HB, and number of columns for B is WB, as we show in this uh, diagram here. There is a requirement here, which is the number of columns of A has to be equal the number of rows of B. This is because we have uh, the matrix multiplication defined as each of these resulting elements in the matrix C, this element is actually the dot product of this row vector of A with this column vector of B. And we'll show you the exact calculation in the next slide. If we're implementing this matrix multiplication using a C program, and this is what we're going to have to write. We're essentially going to have nested loops so that we're going to go over each of these elements in the matrix C. And for each of these elements in C, we're going to calculate the dot product of this row vector from A and this column vector from B. To implement this operation, we essentially have these two nested two levels of loops. In the first loop, we're going to use iteration variable i to go through from 0 to height of a. This essentially is to, we're going to go over every single row of this matrix C. The second loop with variable j, and we're going to go through from 0 to the width of b. Essentially, we're going to go over every column in this matrix C. So at this point, we're going to calculate this single element of C with uh, coordinates i and j. And to do that, we're actually doing the uh, dot product of these two vectors. So in the third loop, where we have the variable k iterates from 0 to the width of a. So essentially, we're going to go over every single element in this uh, row vector and do the multiplication with the corresponding element in this column vector. And eventually, uh, add all these uh, multiplication results uh, up, and that's the dot product. And we assign the value into this uh, element in C with the coordinates i and j. So with these three levels of loops, we can implement such a matrix multiplication operation in a serial fashion. Now to look at this solution uh, from another angle, uh, we're showing here the same diagram. Uh, we're trying to calculate each of these elements in the matrix C using the dot product of this uh, row vector of A and column vector of B. As we can see from this diagram, and also from the previous implementation uh, in the C code, we can see that the two outer for loops, they work independently. So essentially, we can go over every single row and every single column of the resulting matrix C. And it doesn't really matter how we do that. We can go through every single one of rows in a random fashion or every single column in a random fashion. It doesn't really matter. 
And uh, for each of this element in matrix C, we can think about this is a separate work item. Uh, the concept of work item has been uh, mentioned earlier when we discussed the uh, OpenCL concepts. And this work item can be created for each output element of the matrix. Essentially, in the hardware implementation, no matter you use FPGA or GPUs, the processing elements will perform the computation to calculate this resulting element of this resulting element in C. So what we can do is, uh, for this uh, matrix multiplication, because these work items can be created independently from the other ones, we can, do, uh, we can map these two outer for loops to the two-dimensional range work items. So if you think about this is uh, the uh, resulting matrix, and each of this element is one of the two-dimensional, so this is a kind of the x dimension and y dimension. Each element is one of the two-dimensional range work items. So with this understanding, now we can implement such matrix multiplication in OpenCL kernel. Keep in mind that for a single kernel, we are only focusing on the work that has to be done on a single work item. So if we go back to the previous slide, we know that the single work item is to calculate this element, uh, I of J, at, uh, this element C at coordinates I and J. And the way we'll calculate is by doing the dot product of this row matrix. The way to calculate it is to use uh, this row vector and column vector and to do the dot product. So let's look at this kernel implementation. The kernel is named as simple multiply. Keep in mind, we have to add this underscore underscore kernel, this reserved keyword, to indicate that this is a kernel function. And the return of kernel function is void. There's really no return value from the kernel function itself. With that said, it doesn't mean we cannot return results uh, through vectors, through buffers. This is really what we are doing here. This first argument for this kernel function is the pointer to output uh, matrix C. This underscore underscore global is to say that this buffer or this resulting matrix is going to be stored in a global memory. And the type of this buffer uh, is going to be float. So every single element in this buffer is a floating point number. And then we have the next four arguments are the width and height of the two input matrices. So we have width of A, height of A, and width of B, and height of B. The last two arguments of this kernel function are the pointers to the input arrays or input matrices. And both of them, input A and input B, are pointers to global memory, and they are of uh, float type. So this is the definition of the kernel function name and the list of arguments that this kernel function requires. And when you instantiate this kernel or call this kernel from the main function, you have to supply all these arguments in the proper order. The body of this kernel function is as follows. As we can see that we're going to get the coordinates of this uh, element and which is the work item that we're focusing on right now. And because we're using two-dimensional computing domain, as we showed in the previous slide, so that's why we use global ID 1, global ID 0, to get the position information in this x dimension and y dimension. Use It doesn't really matter which uh, coordinate directions you use, but we're going to have to use these two dimensionals but we're going to have to use these two dimensions to get the uh, index uh, from these global IDs. And then we're going to initialize the uh, sum, var this variable sum uh, 
to be a zero to get ready for accumulation. Following that, we have this uh, simple for loop. And uh, we have the loop variable i iterates from 0 to uh, up to the width of a. Uh, and then we're going to do this dot product uh, operation, which essentially do the multiply uh, on this uh, element of uh, row vector from a and a column vector from b. So this for loop is essentially the innermost loop in the original C implementation. Now we have to be very careful uh, in a way that we calculate the indices for this uh, input A array and also input B. So this input A is in fact the, the row vector and then this input B is in fact the column vector. Now because we are talking about row vector in the input A, so we will have to use the width of A times the row in the indices that we got from this uh, dimension one, we use it at the row index, and plus this i. So this is how we store the uh, two-dimensional input matrix into a single dimension array, because you know in the physical memory everything is linear. So we have to use this row multiplied with width of a plus this. Uh, uh, um, with a which is il which um, essentially iterates through the width of a similarly we have to calculate the index of this column vector B and because it's column vector so we're gonna use this I times the width of B because that's how many uh, elements in a column and then we add that uh, with this uh, column uh, number that we get from the global index. So I think what's important here is you need to understand why and how we're going to use the row numbers and column numbers to calculate the right index to find the right element in this row vector in A and column vector in B in order for us to perform the dot product operation. Once this for loop is completed and we get the uh, dot product result in sum and we're going to assign that into this resulting um, element in C. Again, we have to be careful how we use the row number and column index number to calculate the uh, indices uh, in the uh, linear fashion because again, uh, we're storing this matrix C uh, in the physical memory, which uh, it has a linear address space. And the way we calculate is to use the row number times width of B, uh, which essentially is the uh, width of C, and we're going to add that uh, to this column number. So that's the uh, exact location of this resulting element in C. So that's the kernel function. Let me just quickly review this. Uh, we have the kernel function name and we have a list of these kernel arguments and we have these two statements to obtain the uh, indices in the in the two dimensions that we're going to use and then we initialize this sum variable with zero and then we're going to go through the iterations uh, of these uh, elements in the row vector of a and column vector of b to calculate the dot product and then we assign the result into the corresponding element in C. So we showed you a kernel function. Now this kernel function cannot be uh, executed just by itself on the FPGA or GPUs in the OpenCL programming framework. There's still something else we need to do in order for us to instantiate kernels and to run these kernels on parallel computing units. Uh, we will have to set up the environment for computation. This environment is really uh, platform dependent. Uh, this is where we're going to understand the available resources in the platform uh, and we're going to have to uh, understand the important uh, parameters in this platform, for example, the number of compute units, uh, the memory size, etc.
Following that, we need to prepare for the uh, kernel to work. And for that, we need to create context. And also within the context, we need to create command Q. And we'll talk more about that. Essentially, this context and command Q are abstractions of this uh, kernel, um, of this resources available on OpenCL. And with this context and command Q, we can manipulate the data uh, for inputs and outputs. Also, more importantly, we can use the context and command queue to instantiate kernels. Once we get that ready, we have to uh, prepare input data. Uh, this involves allocation of buffers on the host side and then copy the uh, data from the host memory to the device memory to get it ready for the kernel computation. Once the uh, data buffer is ready, then we'll dispatch the kernel. And at that time, you need to define the uh, number of uh, kernels you want to instantiate, how many dimensions you want to use, and also um, initialize the arguments that are needed for uh, executing the kernel. Once the kernel is completed, we need to collect results. And to do that, we will read uh, the device memory to obtain the final results. This slide shows the basic programming steps for building an OpenCL application. The OpenCL application has basically two uh, layers, platform layer and runtime layer. During the platform layer, the program has to query the OpenCL platform. It is important to know the available devices in this platform and also in some cases we have to know the parameters on this device so that we can understand the resources better. After that we need to create an OpenCL context and a very important step is to create a command queue which will be used later for buffer operations, kernel launches, etc. So this command queue is a central so this command queue is a very important element that will be used throughout the OpenCL application. Then we need to create buffers. Buffers are important elements for us to use for exchanging data between the host and the device. With buffers, we can copy the initial data from the host memory to the device memory for the device to compute on. And after the computation is done on the device, and we'll use buffers to copy the results back to the host. Next step is to compile program. Uh, here we are really referring to the kernel program. We see that we can have a kernel function stored in the .cl file, and then we need to compile the kernel into a binary that can be executed on the accelerator device, either FPGA or GPU. So the compilation is really uh, device specific. If we are running the OpenCL kernel on a GPU, then the compilation will be performed by the GPU compiler. If we are running uh, an OpenCL application on an FPGA device, then the kernel will be compiled by the FPGA's OpenCL development kit. So it's uh, often time we have some differences in terms of kernel compilation at this step. And also the main difference between the GPU compilation and uh, the FPGA uh, compilation is the time. Uh, we know that uh, GPU uh, compilation can be very quick, and whereas the uh, compilation for a FPGA binary could take hours. So that is why we have to deal with this kernel compilation differently for GPU devices and FPGA devices. And also we'll show you uh, in the next example uh, how we are um, doing this differently for different devices. After the kernel is compiled, and we can then uh, instantiate the kernel. And to do that, we need to set proper arguments. We need to pass the values of these arguments to the kernel function before we actually uh, run the kernels. Once the arguments are passed into the kernel, 
and then we can start executing the kernel. Eventually, when the kernel is completed, we can then copy the results back from the device to the host memory. So let's begin with the first step, setup environment. Here we'll look at how we query the platform and device, and how do we declare a context, and how do we create uh, command queues. The first line of code is to get platform ID. Uh, at this time, you notice that all the OpenCL functions, they start with CL, uh, lowercase, then, uh, then the operation name after that. So this first statement is to get the platform IDs. Now the parameter we pass into this uh, statement is that one means uh, how many uh, platform descriptors we'll be able to get, and but we don't pass in a platform uh, ID array uh, to store the information, which is fine. But the most important thing is we're going to use this platform count to uh, record the number of uh, platforms uh, available in this system. Uh, assuming platform count is uh, declared as a variable, integer variable ahead of time. So we pass in this uh, pr uh, reference of the variable, and the this CL get platforms ID will report the number of platforms into this variable. And then we use that variable uh, to uh, allocate the platforms uh, variable. And this is actually an array of uh, platform descriptors that we can use uh, following uh, later. Now we have this a uh, number of platforms. And now we can also have uh, platforms, which is an array of uh, platform descriptors. Now, at this time, we'll use uh, those numbers to actually get the platform information. So these first three lines seems a little bit odd. Uh, what we are actually doing is, in the first line, we're going to uh, get the number of platforms. And then the second line is to allocate the space to store the platform IDs. And the third line is actually get the platform IDs uh, from this get platform ID call. Now, assuming in the later um, implementation we only use platform zero, so even if there are, even if there could be more platforms, we only use the first platform. Then we pass this platform zero into this uh, uh, another OpenCL API, CL get device IDs. At this stage, we can choose the uh, available devices within this platform. You can choose the default device. You can also choose specific devices, such as CPU or GPU. And then you will uh, use this device ID and return number of devices to record the uh, descriptors of the devices returned. And then you can use this get device info uh, API to get uh, more detailed information regarding the chosen device. So you can uh, select the uh, device name uh, as the information to report, and then you can print that out. At this time, you can uh, rest sure that you have access to the platform, and you can f uh, you are able to find a open sale device that's available for use. Now we're going to go to the next uh, uh, step here to create open sale context. As we mentioned earlier, context is a very important uh, object in open sale framework. And context is an enclosure of all the uh, resources, command queues, buffers, uh, all tied into this context. As example here, we're going to create a command queue within this context. And also, we say that uh, this command queue is for uh, this device, where this device ID is the identifier of the chosen device. And it has a return value, and you can check the return value uh, for you know, success or fail. And it's highly recommended that you do that 
in order to make sure every API call succeed. The next major step is to declare buffers and try to move data. Now, we're doing this matrix multiplication. Uh, remember, we have A, B, and C. A and B are input matrices, and C is an output matrix. And because the way we store these data in the uh, physical memory, which has a linear address space, so we actually store them in a float type arrays. Uh, and we assume that A, B, C are all these flow type arrays that have been declared uh, ahead of time. So at this point, we can use OpenCL functions uh, APIs to create buffers. The first example here is we create buffer A, uh, where we use this CL create buffer. Uh, as you can see, we use this context again because uh, this buffer and any uh, other buffers we use in this example are within this context. The type of this buffer A is read-only. And the size is uh, this width of A times height of A uh, times the size of float. And then uh, we have another parameter uh, for passing in the um, host buffers, which we don't need, and the return value. Now note that in this case, because buffer A is an uh, input uh, matrix, so uh, for the device, uh, it only has to read data from this buffer A. That's why we say this is CL mem read only. And also you can have uh, another buffer uh, with a type uh, write only or even read and write. After buffer A is created, uh, we'll then copy the data, uh, which is the initial matrix A, to this buffer. And note that this buffer A is actually a buffer on the device. So the way we copy data is to use CL in Q write buffer. And uh, we will use this command Q, which was created earlier. And we're going to uh, put the uh, target uh, buffer, which is the buffer A, where we run, want to write data to. CL true is for synchronization purpose. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, you can just leave it here. And uh, this is another parameter. We uh, typically leave it as a zero. Uh, and then we use the uh, size of the array uh, and types times the uh, size of the data. And uh, then we will uh, pass in the uh, host buffer pointer. So this A is the um, buffer memory on the host side, which contains the initial data. And we have uh, zero now, now as the default uh, arguments going to be passed in. So at this point, you have a buffer A that is allocated on the device side. Also, we're trying to uh, write initial data to this buffer A by using this CL in Q write buffer. Similarly, we'll do the buffer allocation for matrix B, which is also on the device. Uh, as you can see here, buffer B is uh, created using CL create buffer, and the type is memory read only, uh, same as the buffer A, and also the size of uh, matrix B. And then we're going to do another buffer write operation to copy the initial value of uh, matrix B into this buffer B, which resides on the device side. Now, this next step is to allocate space for matrix C. Remember, matrix C is the output matrix. So from the point of the device, uh, this matrix C has to be uh, written. Uh, we're going to put the uh, calculation results into this matrix C. That's why when we create this buffer C, we declare it as a CL memory write only because the device the FPGA or GPU only has to write the results to this buffer C. Even though we declare this buffer C as a CL memory write only, it does not prevent us from reading this buffer from the host side. And that's what we have to do because eventually the host 
has to retrieve the results from this device and copy the, the uh, resulting uh, matrix from buffer C to somewhere in the host. Now, I just want to show you the uh, full definition of this API, CL create buffer. It takes five arguments for this API. Context is the uh, context we created for this OpenCL program. There are certain flags you can pass in which indicates the types of this buffer. It could be read-write, so you can both read and write, or it could be write-only or read-only. And there's some other uh, types you can use as well. The third argument is the size of, of the buffer, and the fourth argument is the host pointer, which uh, has the um, a corresponding memory location on the host side for uh, read and write operations. And uh, the last uh, argument is actually the return value. The third major step in this OpenCL program is kernel compilation. Now, I want to show you here a very simple compilation process for FPGA devices. Uh, and keep in mind that it, we will see uh, quite different things for FPGAs in terms of the uh, kernel compilation. Because for FPGAs, we have to do a compilation offline. Uh, so it's a little bit different uh, from what we see here. In this example, we assume that the uh, program source, uh, this, the source code in the uh, kernel.cl file is uh, stored in uh, some um, variable already. And uh, typically the host will allocate a uh, character buffer or character array to store all the source code uh, that read from this kernel source file. So we'll call this CL create program with source. And CTX is a uh, context uh, that you have been uh, created. Uh, one is the default parameter, uh, which we'll talk about later. And here is the uh, pointer to the source code. And also it has another default uh, parameter argument to this call and the return value. Once we create this program, then we need to build the program. Build the program is essentially the way to compile the OpenCL source code into a binary. So what we do here is we call this API CL build program. My program is the one you just created and also along with some default arguments. And this uh, CL build program will return success or failure depends on the compilation result. Now, the compilation is done uh, on the whole uh, kernel source code uh, because a sworn kernel source code may contain multiple kernel functions. Uh, so the next step is to create a kernel by selecting the right kernel function from that source code. So because you may have multiply function, uh, uh, kernel function, uh, addition kernel function, or other kernel functions, in the same .cl program. With compilation, you can have all the uh, entry point to these different kernel functions. So this CL create kernel is to really uh, select the uh, right entry point for the specific kernel function you choose to use. And the input argument is the my program, which was created uh, ahead of time. And the second argument is the kernel function name that you choose to use. The fourth major step is to run the kernel program. Now, before we run the kernel program, we have to initial the kernel arguments properly. When we design any kernel function, we will typically have uh, some number of kernel arguments. And we will do this kernel arguments uh, initialization uh, in this way in the host side. On the host program, which we're seeing here, we use CL set kernel argument. This is an OpenCL API. Uh, 
The first argument to this call is the kernel that you just created using CL create kernel API call. And then you use a number to indicate which kernel argument you're trying to initialize. Following that, you will specify the size of the kernel argument and then the actual value of the argument. Uh, here, when we uh, say the actual value, we actually pass in a pointer that points to the actual value. So in this way, you can set all the necessary arguments for this particular kernel. In our example of matrix multiplication, we actually need seven of these arguments to be set up properly. The first argument is the, uh, um, the destination uh, buffer or the resulting matrix, which is the, the buffer C. It's spelled differently here, but you know this should be the buffer C we created. Following that, we have the uh, size of these matrices, A and B, uh, the width and height of these uh, matrices. And then we have the uh, two input matrices. Now, one thing you have to um, be very careful is when you initialize multiple kernel arguments, you have to make sure these uh, indices of these arguments are set up properly. Often the time when you do a uh, copy paste of this line to uh, set up another uh, argument, you forgot to change the indices here. And that caused some problems that you will be uh, encountering when you execute the kernels. Next step uh, in running the kernel, well, before we actually run it, we have to set a local and global workgroup size. This is where we specify the number of work items in the group and also the number of work groups. Uh, in this example, we're choosing to use two dimensional uh, compute domain. And the way we set up this is that in each work group, we want to have 16 work items. As we see here, this is the work local work group size. For dimension zero, we want to have 16 work items. And for dimension one, we also want 16 work items. And for global work group size, uh, we also have two dimensions here. Uh, we're going to say we want to have WC these many work items in the zero dimension. And also for uh, the one dimension, we have HC these many work items uh, for the global size. Once we have these kernel arguments and the local work group size and global work group size set up properly, we can now execute the kernel. We'll call this OpenCL API. CL in queue ND range kernel to instantiate the kernels. The first argument is the command queue, and the second argument is the kernel object that you created. And we're going to specify how many dimensions we want to use, and this optionally you can choose the work item uh, global offset, which we uh, often just uh, know. And for uh, the next two arguments, we're going to specify the global work group size and local work group size. The final three arguments to this CL in QND range kernel call are related to uh, events. Uh, essentially, in this example, we don't have any events that we're going to wait for and will not generate any events uh, from this uh, kernel execution. And we will talk more about events and how we can use them in the later lectures. The final step in this OpenCL program is to obtain results after the kernel execution is completed. Uh, we will use uh, this CL in queue read buffer to read results back from the device to the host memory. At this point, we assume that the kernel execution has completed. Uh, so in this read buffer API, we will use the command queue and uh, we'll use the uh, output buffer and we will use the CL true to indicate uh, the synchronization requirements, uh, which means that we want to uh, be able to, um, this call will not return until the read is complete. And we'll indicate the size of the uh, buffer and the uh, pointer to the host memory where we want to read the results to. The last three 
uh, arguments in this API call are again related to events. Uh, in this example, we are indicating we're not waiting for any events, and also this API call will not generate any events. And we'll talk more about events uh, in future lectures. Next, uh, we're going to use this opportunity to show you uh, how we run the matrix uh, multiplication example. Let's look at this matrix multiplication example. We have a couple of uh, source code files under this matrix multiplication folder. Main.c is the host side program. MyKernel.cl is the uh, kernel program. And we have a make file to help us compile the project. Let's look at the host side program. This is main.c. As we see, it's a C program, essentially, uh, with these uh, header inclusions to include the standard libraries. And then we have a macro definition, underscore apple, underscore, underscore. Uh, and this uh, includes uh, some of the header files that are specific to the OpenCL framework on the Mac OS. And if we are using FPGA, specifically the Altera FPGA, and we're going to have to include different folders, I'm sorry, different header files. And also on the FPGA side, uh, open, uh, Altera OpenCL framework supports uh, C++ binders, so we can use namespaces and also use some of the functions uh, in the OpenCL uh, utilities implemented on the FPGA. And we uh, also need to declare a cleanup function, which is part of the uh, required you know, uh, helper functions uh, on the Altera OpenCL side. Uh, to help us clean up the uh, framework. And then we have uh, definitions for the device name. Uh, we have an array uh, with a certain number of characters defined. Now here A and B, we have two floating point arrays. These are the two input matrices we're going to use for calculation. This matrix A is a 2 by 4 matrix. It has two rows, four columns. And the initial value in this uh, uh, matrix A is 1.0, our floating point. For matrix B, we have a uh, 24 elements. So this is a 4 by 6 matrix. It has 4 rows and 6 columns. And so as you can imagine, that uh, the resulting matrix C will be a 2 row, uh, 6 column matrix. In the main program, we start with a list of uh, variable declarations for the number of platforms, the uh, array for storing platform identifiers, and device ID, and number of devices, um, and also the return value. We also declare uh, CL context, so we can use this context to uh, encapsulate all the objects uh, in the OpenCL framework. We have the command queue declared, uh, the OpenCL program, and OpenCL kernel uh, declared here. This uh, file pointer is what we use to open the uh, kernel source code. And we give uh, a fixed name, uh, which is the uh, mykernel.cl in the current directory. So we'll use the um, fopen function to read the kernel source code from this .cl file and then to compile it at runtime. And then we uh, describe the sizes of these input matrices. So for the matrix A, the width is 4, height is 2. Essentially, this is the number of rows, and this 4 is the number of columns. Similarly, for the matrix B, we have width of 6, height of B, uh, so it's a 4 by 6 matrix. The size of the resulting matrix C, uh, the width of C is uh, the same as the width of B, and the height of C is the same as the height of uh, matrix A. So these are the uh, variable declarations. 
Now, what we are seeing here in this part of the source code is where we uh, get the platform IDs and also get the device IDs. Let's look at the case on a Mac OS, which supports uh, OpenCL uh, native. Uh, we can first call this get platform ID, uh, give uh, one as the number of uh, platforms we expect to have, and also the platform count is to uh, return the number of platforms. Then we allocate the array uh, to store the number of um, store the IDs of these platforms. Then we call this get platform ID the th second time to obtain the actual platform IDs. Uh, these three lines seems a little bit uh, redundant, uh, but uh, typically this is how it's done on the OpenCL. Um, the next two lines are getting these uh, device IDs uh, using a chosen specific type. We can just say we want to have a default OpenCL device. Uh, the Mac OS, uh, by default, it, the uh, OpenCL device is a GPU device. And we can use this device ID to store the device ID descriptor. And also, uh, we can uh, find out how many of such devices uh, that are available on the Mac OS. And, and typically, it's a one. We can also query the information of this device. In this example, we query the name. And we can store the name uh, into this uh, uh, character array. And then we we'll print the name out. On the Altara FPGA, uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, we uh, also list the code here. So we'll start with get platform ID, and then we'll allocate the space uh, for storing these platform IDs. And then uh, we're going to use this find platform to make sure that we do have uh, Intel FPGA OpenCL platform available on this host. And so this find platform is a utility function implemented by OpenCL, uh, Altera OpenCL runtime. And if we do not find such a platform, uh, we will have to uh, report that, and then we'll uh, terminate this program. Now, by this point, we find the uh, Altera FPGA OpenCL device. Uh, we will try to get all the available OpenCL devices. And we're really talking about the uh, devices in this OpenCL FPGA platform. So you can expect you're going to get uh, uh, one or more FPGA devices. We'll then print out the platform name. Uh, we can also print out the number of devices we are able to find uh, on this platform. And uh, we will say we want to use uh, one OpenCL uh, device on this platform, and that is the FPGA device. Uh, you can double check by print out the device name, uh, which will show you what, what kind of FPGA boards it has on this platform. Uh, currently, uh, this host side source code supports uh, both uh, Mac OS and also our uh, OpenCL SDK uh, by Altera. Uh, if uh, it is running on a different platform, and they will, uh, the program will report an error. Now we queried the platform and also find out the devices. The next step is to create OpenCL context. Uh, we'll call OCL create context. We will use the device IDs. Uh, in our case, we are using one devi device and you can use multiple devices. And the return value will be the context object. Uh, also, you have to uh, sometimes check this return value to make sure this create context uh, is uh, not uh, having any problems. On top of this context, you can create command queues. Each uh, device can have a command queue associated with a device. So this API CL create command queue, you uh, take uh, context and device ID as the arguments uh, to create such, uh, this command queue. Next step is to compile the OpenCL program. 
Now I want to first show you on the Mac OS platform, uh, which typically has a GPU, and how we're going to load the source code and then compile uh, the program. So we will use fopen to open the uh, kernel source code file. Uh, we already gave the file name uh, mykernel.cl, so we're going to open that. And we will read uh, the source code from the file and then read all the characters and put them into this source uh, str, this array, which uh, holds all the characters in the OpenCL source code. I mean OpenCL kernel source code. And then we're going to close that uh, uh, file handler. Now the next step is to create kernel program object from the source. So we'll call CL create program with source. Uh, so we'll use the, the current context. We will use the buffer that stores the uh, kernel source code and we will uh, then return a program object. This program object will be used later to create the actual kernels. Up to this point, we see how we can create a program ob object on Mac OS, uh, which has native support to OpenCL. Now in the next few lines, we're going to show you that the way to create uh, such a program object is different on the Altera FPGA uh, OpenCL SDK. Um, what we see here is on the Altera uh, SDK, we will need to create the uh, object from binary. We mentioned earlier that to compile the FPGA uh, using the FPGA uh, design flow, it takes um, you know, tens of minutes or hours to build a binary image. And this is also true for uh, compiling a binary from OpenCL to a FPGA binary. So what we do is we will compile the kernel uh, using uh, SDK from open from Altera OpenCL SDK, and we will now on the host side, we'll use the binary result from that compilation to generate this program object. So what we see here is we will uh, use uh, Altera specific API called get bi board binary file uh, using the name of the uh, kernel and uh, we will also uh, specify the device ID so that they can check uh, whether this uh, binary is uh, indeed designed for the device. And we'll show that we're using the kernel binary, uh, which uh, typically has a dot .aocx as the suffix in the name. And then we'll say create program from binary, uh, use the context, and use the uh, binary file uh, and uh, we'll also supply the device ID. Uh, so as you can see, it's a little bit different uh, how you compile, uh, how you uh, generate the project program object uh, on these two different platforms. After that, for either platform, uh, we will proceed to build the kernel program. So we'll call this CL build program, which will take in the program object created from either the source or the binary, uh, depends on the platform you use. Uh, we'll also supply the device ID. And here we check whether this uh, build program is successful or not. And after that, we will uh, eventually now um, create the kernel program. This kernel object uh, is uh, built based on the program object. Uh, in here, we are simply uh, selecting a particular kernel function from that program object. And the reason behind it is uh, in that program object, in the uh, uh, mykernel.cl, you may have multiple kernel functions. So here, you use the specific kernel name to select the function. So up to this point, we have uh, created the context, created the command queue object, uh, 
Also, we create the program object, and now we have the kernel object ready. So in the next uh, um, section of the program, uh, we will see these uh, buffer management. Uh, this is on the host side. We will allocate a buffer to store the resulting matrix C. And we know the size, so we can allocate uh, that size uh, uh, of array uh, storing these uh, floating point numbers. The next section here, this is what we have saw uh, in the lecture slides. Uh, we essentially create the uh, buffers on the device side. We use CL create buffer to create uh, the buffer A, uh, uh, which is a read-only buffer on the device side. And we will copy the initial uh, value of the uh, matrix A into this buffer A. And we're using CL in queue write buffer to do that. Similarly, we'll uh, create buffer B and also initialize the uh, content of this buffer B using uh, CL in queue write buffer. And uh, after that, we will allocate space for matrix C on the device. Now, this is again what you have saw from the slides. Uh, this is uh, what we have to do to set the kernel arguments. Uh, remember, you need to uh, choose the kernel and also set the proper index for the corresponding kernel arguments. You will supply the size of the argument and the actual value of this argument. And by value, we really mean that we're going to use the pointer to these uh, um, variables uh, so that we can pass in the proper um, buffer pointers and uh, uh, other type of arguments into the kernel. And uh, here we are uh, setting these global workgroup size and local workgroup size. Uh, you see a little bit differently, we choose uh, 2 here instead of 16. is because we would like this to be also executable on the FPGAs, which has a smaller uh, work item size, uh, smaller workgroup size. And this CL in queue ND range kernel, uh, this is for actually instantiating the kernels. We'll um, pass in the command queue object, the kernel function, and we choose uh, two dimension. Uh, there's no offset for the global uh, work items. Uh, we'll supply the work group size uh, for the global and local. And we don't have anything uh, on the uh, events. I added a note here. Uh, I found out that it's very important to check the return value uh, of this CL in queue and the range kernel. Typically, uh, you assume that uh, it will uh, success. Uh, you assume that it will uh, succeed. Uh, however, uh, especially on FPGAs, there are certain occasions that you will have to check to make sure uh, it actually uh, succeed. Otherwise, you will find out uh, you are uh, puzzled why the final results are incorrect. And, and this is uh, why we have this uh, error checking here. Once the kernel execution is completed, uh, we will then read the results uh, to the host memory. Uh, this is what we do. We use CL in queue rebuffer. Uh, it takes arguments, uh, the command queue, uh, the output buffer and also the size of the data you want to copy. And also this is the destination, and it's basically the um, buffer on the host side uh, that we use to store the computation result. After that, you can then verify the results uh, by printing them out. The next few lines are just uh, for you know, best practice. We're gonna free the resources allocated uh, on the host side, also we're going to free the OpenCL resources that we have used. Now let's take a look at mykernel.cl. This is the um, simple multiplication kernel we have designed uh, and we have discussed in our lecture notes. And the name is simple multiply. It takes seven arguments 
and we're gonna use get global ID to get the row number and column number. Then we're gonna perform the dot product operation to iterate through the width uh, of A, basically to multiply the elements in the row vector of matrix A with the column vector in matrix B. Then we're gonna store the results uh, in the corresponding element in um, matrix C. Now let's build the main.c program and also the mykernel.cl program. Let me just clean up uh, what we have built before. And uh, for to build this uh, host side program and also the device side program, we just type make. It's pretty quick. Um, so for the host side program, essentially you are compiling a main.c, a single C program file. And uh, for the my kernel, you are actually using the uh, um, GPU compiler to compile the my kernel.cl into a GPU binary. And uh, the make file actually takes care of different version of GPU binaries that you might use. So Let's look at uh, what we have. After built the program uh, on both the host side and the device side, we now have a executable called the main. Also, we have uh, different binaries uh, available uh, for different GPU versions. Uh, to execute this, uh, we can just simply type the name of the executable main. Okay, so we can see here uh, the device that has been um, find from the OpenCL platform is this AMD uh, Redown Pro 575 Compute Engine. And we're printing out the initial value of the C matrix C and the final results uh, after the matrix multiplication, uh, where uh, this matrix C has eight uh, point zero in all the elements inside this matrix. The second example is image rotation. We know that we have uh, the opportunity to process different images and often the time you want to rotate an image. Like in this example we have a very cute cat and we have its original image on the left and on the right uh, we have a rotated image of the original one and we're rotating uh, counterclockwise for 45 degrees. So this is a good example of uh, image rotation uh, we're looking at. So let's just uh, take a look at the uh, rotation and how it actually works. Uh, there is a math behind the rotation operation. We know that each pixel in the picture has its coordinates and the pixel represents the you know, grayscale or color scale as a part of the image. For the rotation, we actually move the pixels around. Uh, and to be more specific, if we're talking about to rotate a point at uh, x1 and y1 uh, around a uh, origin uh, coordinates x0 and y0, uh, now the new location of this pixel is x2 and y2. And if we're um, using a formula to represent the new location, uh, considering the rotation angle, and here's the formula we're gonna use. So the x2, the new x coordinates of this pixel, will be cosine theta uh, times x1 minus x0 plus sine theta uh, multiplied with y1 minus y0. Similarly, we have a formula to calculate the new location, the new coordinates on the y dimension for this uh, pixel, and it will be minus sine theta multiplied with x1 minus x0 plus cosine theta uh, multiplied with y1 minus y0. Now if we are rotating, let's say, uh, around the origin 0, 0, and typically you are talking about the uh, upper left uh, corner of the image, if that's the case, then this x0, y0 becomes uh, all zeros. Then the new location of this pixel will be uh, in using 
uh, these two formula to calculate. As we see here, um, the new location is really uh, what we are trying to find out. And uh, to rotate this image, we're actually uh, going to copy the pixel information from the original location x1 and y1 to the new location x2 and y2. And during this calculation, uh, the new coordinates on x dimension and y dimension can be calculated independently. As you can see, there's no dependencies uh, between uh, x1 with uh, y2 or y1 with y2. And we can uh, group what well, we can think about a very uh, simple and intuitive way to uh, parallelize these uh, op operations. Uh, to be more specific, we can assign each work item to calculate the new position of a single pixel. So for all the pixels in the original picture, we're going to calculate the new location of that pixel and then assign the uh, pixel information to the new location. And for each work item, we can obtain the location of the pixel using its global ID. And that's how we can uh, initialize the uh, dimensions, the work group size, before we instantiate the kernel. Now we want to look at uh, exactly how we're going to uh, break down this image rotation problem into smaller ones, uh, into these work groups and the work items. So here we are using what's called input decomposition. We mentioned earlier that we're going to use each work item to calculate the new position of a single pixel. So the question is how we're going to divide the uh, a whole global uh, workspace into smaller work groups, and each work group contains some number of work items. Uh, we show here, uh, this is a, a representation of the uh, original image, and we can divide the image, uh, all the pixels, into different work groups. And we're using two dimension uh, compute domain to address this problem. That is to say, we're dividing uh, on the horizontal domain or the, the width domain. Uh, and in this case, we're dividing that into uh, 16 work groups. So if the whole uh, width of this image is W, then we're going to have W over 16 work groups on the horizontal dimension. And we have assumption here, this w is a multiple of 16. So we uh, don't end up uh, with a fractional number. And on this x dimension, on the horizontal dimension, uh, we can see that we can have work group 0, 1, 2, and so on, up to uh, w over 16 minus 1. So altogether, we have w over 16 work groups at the uh, horizontal dimension. We can divide the vertical dimension uh, into uh, work groups also, and uh, assuming that the um, assuming that the height of the image is h, and then we also divide uh, the whole vertical dimension into sixteen work groups. So now we have work group zero, one, and so on, up to this uh, h over sixteen minus one. This w should be uh, h. Um, so this is how we're going to divide uh, the whole picture into work groups. Now let's look at the kernel function that we can use to implement such operation. We define a kernel function. Um, so we can see that we begin with this keyword underscore underscore kernel. Uh, the type of this kernel function or any kernel function is a void and the name of the function is image underscore rotate. It takes a few arguments. Uh, the first is the pointer to the global buffer, and the destination data is where we store the image after rotation. The second argument is uh, a pointer to the global buffer or global memory, and the um, this is the original image. We also provide the uh, width of the original image and height of the original image, the image dimensions. The fifth and sixth 
arguments to this kernel function are the rotation parameters, uh, basically the sine theta and cosine theta we pass into this kernel function. Let's look at now the body of this kernel function. At the beginning, we would like to identify this work item. And essentially, we are trying to figure out what is the original location of this pixel. And we know that we need to go through every single pixel uh, in the image. So we'll use this get global ID dimension 0 and get global ID dimension 1 to essentially get the coordinate of this original pixel. So this ix and iy is the uh, coordinates of this pixel. What we want to do here is we would like to calculate the new location of this pixel in the rotated image. Uh, uh, you, you can recall that we have uh, formulas to calculate y2 and x2, and this is where we're going to apply those two formulas to calculate the new location of this image using the um, uh, rotation parameters. So what we have here is this ix, iy is the original coordinates of the sing single pixel, and this x position and y position are the new coordinates of this single pixel. So the next few lines, what we're about to do is to copy the information of this pixel, being either grayscale or color scale. So we're going to copy that content, the uh, information of this pixel, from the original location to the new location. Before we do that, we actually have to do one more thing. We have to do bond checking. Uh, because the way we do the rotation, and it depends on which uh, coordinates we sh choose to use as the origin, and we will end up having, in some cases, the new location, uh, the new coordinates will be out of the bound boundary of the original image. So this is what we have to do here to make sure that the new location, the new coordinates, uh, actually uh, fall into the uh, original image size. So we're going to check whether uh, the x coordinates is greater or equal to 0, and uh, this x coordinate is uh, within the width of the picture. Similarly, we check the uh, y coordinates to make sure it is a positive value, and also it's within the height of the image. If that's the case, then we'll just uh, you know copy the pixel information from the original location to the new location. And uh, we'll have to do a little bit calculation here, since you know the physical memory stores data in all the linear address space. So we will have to use the coordinates to calculate the location of the pixel in the physical memory. So we'll use this uh, y, which is the uh, row number, and we will uh, multiply with this width of the image, then plus x. And we do the same for the uh, original pixel and the new location of the pixel. And here we used that location to read the uh, information of this pixel and assign that to the new location in the rotated image. Here we uh, list the complete code. You may notice there is a difference between this uh, example and the previous example of matrix multiplication. Mainly is that we have this C++ binding uh, in the host side application. You can see that we're using C++ uh, naming uh, convention to say that we want to create a vector of platforms, and we have the functions to uh, call to retrieve the IDs of these platforms, and we'll create uh, you know context, uh, create a, a command queue. So all these are a little bit different from we uh, used in the previous exa example. Even though this implementation is based on C++ binding for the OpenCL APIs. Uh, the steps are essentially the same. So we first set up the environment to query the platforms, uh, query the device, and then we create the command queue. 
Then we declare buffers to move data, uh, move the initial image from the host memory to the buffer on the device. This is where you can see that we can have this uh, read-only buffer created. That's the image that's to be rotated. And also we have this in queue write buffer to copy the original image into this um, image buffer. And then we will uh, need to compile the kernel. We read in the program source. Uh, we will create the program object, and then we we'll create the kernel. And then we will execute the kernel by in instantiating uh, the correct parameters and also ND range parameters. Uh, as you can see here, we calculate the cosine and sine value using the rotation angle and we'll set the kernel arguments uh, in the right order. So we'll initialize the uh, destination um, buffer um, and also the source buffer on the device side to store the new image and the original image. We'll supply the uh, dimensions of this original picture and then we'll supply the rotation parameters. Here, uh, we actually choose the size of the work groups uh, we uh, now say we want to um, perform this kernel functions on the whole image. So the global size is really the size of the image, uh, width and height. And then for the work group size, uh, we choose 16 and 16 uh, on both of these two dimensions, on both of these two dimensions. So we know that each work group has 16 by 16 work items. Then we're going to run the kernel by calling in, in by calling in queue ND range kernel, um, providing the kernel object and the uh, parameters uh, that we need to uh, instantiate the kernel. Essentially, the global workgroup size and local workgroup size. Once the kernel is completed, we'll read the results back to the host. So we'll have an in queue read buffer to read the um, content for the new image from the um, buffer on the device to the uh, buffer on the host. Now we're going to see the demonstration of this example. So here's the uh, folder with the image rotation source code. Uh, we have, uh, as we saw before, uh, two main source code files, main.c and mykernel.cl. Uh, we have another several folders under this directory. Uh, one has the images. This is the original image that we want to rotate. Also, it has a utilities folder that consists of several utility C code, which really help us to, um, to open the um, image in the uh, BMP format and uh, to do the uh, all the other supporting functions. Also, we didn't talk about the AOCL underscore common. Uh, that is a folder uh, specific to Altera OpenCL SDK. Uh, and this folder, it has source code related to the um, OpenCL specific functions for uh, uh, OpenCL platforms on top of Altera FPGA. So we're going to uh, look at the source code briefly. And so we have the typical header file at the beginning um, for Mac OS and for Altera OpenCL platform. We have different header files included. Also, it includes the uh, utilities uh, functions provided as part of the image rotation. We also define the uh, image um, path, the where we can where we can find the original image. Um, the, the beginning of the main program, we see the similar things: the uh, definitions of platforms, device IDs, uh, contacts, command queue, program object, kernel object. Uh, we also have buffers for input image and output image. 
And we, in this example, assume that we are rotating this image uh, kind of uh, counterclockwise 315 degrees. And uh, these are the uh, rotation parameters calculated. Uh, we're going to use my kernel.cl as my kernel source code. At the beginning of the main program, we open the uh, BMP image file and we read in the images uh, which was in BMP format. And uh, this uh, read BMP float essentially going to open that image file and do this uh, format conversion so we have uh, a large array of floating point numbers stored in this H input image buffer. This is the buffer on the host. And we also get the rows and columns of this image, which we'll use for uh, defining other buffers and uh, also used in instantiating kernels. This is where we create the output buffer on the host. And uh, we initialize this buffer uh, by using some random number. Now, this part of the code, uh, we have the same thing we did in the matrix multiplication example. This is where we query the platform. We find out the devices on the platform and try to use that device. And you, you can see that we do differently on Mac OS and on the Altera PJ platform. After that, we'll create context that is um, bind to this device. And also for this device, we'll create a command queue. Following those, we will open the mykernel.cl um, kernel source code, and we will uh, try to create the program using the source code for macOS. For Altera, uh, we will try to open the binary, uh, which was created by using Altera's uh, AOC compiler. Next, we're going to build the program object and create the kernel object. We now uh, specified in uh, kernel function name, uh, image rotate, which is the one we're going to use to perform image rotation. Next, we'll create buffers. Uh, we'll create a buffer for input image, and we'll create a buffer for output image. Now, note that both of these two buffers are device side buffers. Uh, because they were created using CL create buffer. And these are the buffers we use on the device side to store the original image and to store the uh, output image, the rotated image, um, after the kernel is completed. We'll now uh, copy the original image, which is stored in this H Im image uh, host side buffer. We'll copy all the uh, pixel information to the uh, buffer on the device side, which is named as input image. And then we need to set the proper kernel arguments. We'll uh, supply the pointers to these buffers, um, output, input. We will also provide the dimensions of this image and also the rotation parameters. We will execute the kernel. As you can see that, we're going to define the global workgroup size as the whole image. So we'll have this uh, width and height of the image used uh, defined here as the global size. For the local workgroup size, or the number of items within the workgroups, uh, we can choose a number. Uh, now we choose 8 uh, instead of 16, um, partly because that's the number we uh, test out on FPJ side. And then we will instantiate a kernel using NQ and dRange kernel. We'll provide the command Q, the kernel object. We'll choose the dimension. And there's no offset uh, that we want to use. And uh, then we'll supply the global workgroup size and local workgroup size. Again, here we're not using any events to synchronize with other 
uh, kernel functions, so we'll just provide uh, zero now, now as the default arguments. Note that here we check the return value to make sure that this in queue uh, kernel range, ND range kernel uh, is successful, uh, especially when you do this on the FPGA side. At this point, we assume the kernel is completed so we can read the output data back to the host. So we'll use the um, pointer to the global memory on the device side and also we'll provide the uh, host buffer and to uh, also provide the size of the uh, result. The next three lines are really used for storing the image uh, into a BMP format. Uh, there's a little bit uh, formatting um, com conversion. There's a little bit BMP formatting uh, involved, so we'll use this utility function write BMP float, which takes in the uh, image in a linear array and uh, the size of the image and then the name of the image file. So this will be, uh, this function will create uh, the um, new BMP file uh, that can show the result. After that, we'll uh, do the best practice to uh, free the host resources and also free the OpenCL resources. So that's the main function. Kernel function uh, is the same that we uh, described uh, in the lecture. So it takes in the destination uh, buffer pointer and source buffer pointer, the dimensions of this image, and the rotation parameters. And it will get the uh, original coordinates of this pixel using two dimensions, so 0 and 1. Then we'll use the formula to calculate the new coordinates of this pixel. And after that, we will assign the pixel value to the new location. But before we do that, we need to do this boundary checking. And then eventually, we will do the uh, copying of the pixel information to from the original location um, to the new location. So let's uh, just uh, build this uh, program and then see how it works. So we'll build this again. It's on the macOS side. Uh, you might see different things uh, when you build this uh, on the uh, Altera FPGA platform. And then uh, we'll just run it. So we can see that we have read the original image, which has um, 720 by 1080 pixels and the output image has been computed and it's saved as uh, cat rotated.bmp so let's check the results this is the image rotation folder uh, in the uh, this image folder I have this original image uh, which you can see that this cat uh, is the one we're going to do the rotation. And we come back here. Um, this is the picture created after the rotation is done. So we can see that we essentially um, turn the image clockwise uh, by 45 degrees. The third example we're going to discuss today is image convolution. Image convolution is operation that modifies the value of each pixel in the image and using the information from its neighboring pixels. So think about convolution is an operation of filtering. We apply some kind of filters to the original image. And these filters define the influence of neighboring pixels. For example, we can apply a blurring filter in the blurring filter, we essentially take the weighted average of neighboring pixels so that we can reduce the large differences between the pixel values, especially the neighboring pixels. Now let's look at this example. We're showing a source image and we want to apply some kind of a filter 
uh, and then we will want to get a filtered image. So on the left side, we're showing here 5 by 6 uh, source image, and the values in each of these grid boxes representing the grayscale or color scale of that pixel. So we can see here we uh, have a small region in the original image, uh, 3 by 3, and we have uh, these uh, values uh, in these corresponding pixels in this 3 by 3 region. And this here, uh, this is the filter we want to apply. So essentially what we want to do is we want to use this 3 by 3 filter and we want to perform um, this uh, element-wise uh, multiplication on this pixel and then use the sum of all these uh, multiplication results and that will give us the uh, value of this um, new pixel in the filtered image. So look at this center of this 3x3 three three region and we're going to use uh, the neighbors of this pixel. Now we have eight neighbors and we're going to multiply the values of these pixels with this corresponding location in a filter and then we're going to do the summation on the values of all these products. So that's what we uh, see here, this uh, minus one times one that's taking this pixel with the corresponding pixel in a filter. And this is 0 times 4, that's taking this value here and with this pixel. So and so, we have all nine um, pairs of multiplications, and then we sum the uh, multiplication results all together, and eventually we get the value 7. So 7 will be the uh, final value at this location in the filtered image. As you can see, we will have to uh, apply such filtering operations for every single image. And because the way the pixels are organized, and it's fine that we can do such multiplication on these um, you know, different pixel locations, but there's, uh, there are certain pixel locations we have to be very careful especially those close to the boundary. Because when we look at these pixels, it does not have all eight neighboring pixels. Because it's close to the boundary, some of the locations are actually out of boundary. So you cannot get all the three uh, neighboring, all the eight neighboring pixels to apply the filter. And not only filtering operations, other kinds of image processing operations also have to take that into consideration. Okay, we show here several example filters. And we have the original image, the cute cat. And we can apply different filters to uh, come up with different uh, effects on the original image. We can do blurring. This is the blurred picture. We can also do edge detection. So this here shows you know, what are the uh, edges that appear in the original image. The difference between these filters uh, is actually residing in the values in the uh, filtering uh, region, in the filter uh, um, pixel region. We'd like to first show a C implementation of the image convolution function. Uh, we're seeing here uh, there are two uh, outer for loops, and these two outer for loops illustrate over the source image. Uh, it will go through every single pixel uh, from the x dimension, or the width dimension, and then the height dimension. Uh, and then we will apply the filter to that pixel. In the third loop here, we essentially go through the uh, elements in a filter. Uh, we can see here we're going through the half of the filter width, assuming the filter is a uh, square shape, uh, which is typically the case. Uh, so we'll uh, choose the half size 
on the x dimension and then a half size on the y dimension will go uh, go left and the right centering around the center pixel that we're working on and we're gonna you know um, do the multiplication and then do the summation to accumulate the products of all the pairs of uh, multiplications um, at the end we'll I'll put the new pixel value into uh, this uh, uh, resulting pixel in the final image. We'd like to talk about a uh, new data structure in OpenCL. It's called image. Image is a abstraction of images. It's an OPIC type uh, that's quite different from an integer, from a pointer. Uh, it cannot be viewed directly uh, through points uh, in a device. So you don't really uh, read the uh, individual bytes in that image data structure. It's internally maintained as a multi-dimensional structure, and we'll see that how we can read values from it and, and write values to it. It is used primarily for image uh, data types. So it is not suitable for other arbitrary structures, for example, integer values, integer arrays, or pointers, etc. The reason we have this image data type, uh, partly because that we uh, have this image uh, data processed in graphics processors, uh, there are a lot of uh, operations that are specific to image data. And uh, these operations sometimes require long instruction sequences, which can be done very efficiently on these graphics processors. So it's uh, uh, helpful to have such image type, which can be specifically processed, optimized by graphics processors. As a programmer, you can specify the image format uh, in the terms of channels, and also we can specify the types of those uh, pixel values, could be float or integer values, etc. Similar to buffers, we can create image objects. Uh, so in this uh, slide, I want to show uh, for this image convolution example, uh, how we create contacts, command cubes, and source image and output image uh, filters, etc. And remember, we need to create such image objects on the device side so we can uh, have the device, uh, the OpenCL computing uh, units, to read the pixels from these image objects and then write the new pixels uh, to a uh, output image object. Let's assume this uh, convolution filter is 7 by 7. Uh, so the filter size is 7 by 7. We now define the uh, format of the image. Uh, we will instantiate a format a variable, which is CL image format, and we'll assign uh, the order and data type. And then we can create the image. We now use a 2D image. Uh, so you can use CL create image 2D uh, and provide the context, provide the format of the image object you want to create, the dimensions of the image, and uh, other um, default parameters related to events. So at this point, you now have a source image buffer, which is going to be on the device side. Similarly, you can create an output image object uh, using the same format and width. You can then create the filter, which is a regular buffer object. Uh, so we do CL create buffer. Uh, providing the context, uh, providing the size of the filter, uh, and then we can then use it uh, as a regular buffer on the device side. In order for the image convolution to work, the first thing we will have to do now is to uh, copy the image data and the filter data to the device. So for the image object, we'll use a new API CL in Q write image as opposed to CL in Q write buffer. Uh, for the uh, CL write image, it's taking similar parameters as the CL write buffer. Mm -hmm. Basically, the, the Q uh, object 
the source image buffer on the device, and then the source image uh, that uh, has been read from the image file. You can also specify the offset that you want the image to be copied to in the image object, uh, also the elements per dimension. And we're providing this uh, width and height of the image to specify the size of the image. We use here CLNQWrite buffer to copy the 7x7 filter to the device. Now I want to introduce uh, a very interesting object called OpenCL Sampler. Sampler is basically an object that is used to describe how to access an image. Uh, let's look at this API call. Um, so you use the context as the first argument, and that's to say I want to create this sampler within this context. And then I will say uh, whether this uh, coordinates are normalized. Uh, typically, you don't use a normalized uh, coordinates unless you are dealing with these uh, fraction numbers as coordinates. So you can say um, CL uh, normalized coordinates uh, will be a CL force. The addressing mode defines how the image coordinates are handled uh, when the coordinates are out of range. It is very useful for image data because you're dealing with uh, the um, pixels that are close or on the border of the image. And then when you do filtering, uh, then chances are you will be needing some neighboring pixels from the outside of the boundary. Now, this addressing mode defines how we can address that uh, case when that happens. Filtering mode uh, is to specify the filter that needs to be applied uh, when the uh, coordinates to that falls into uh, between the pixels. Here is an example that we're going to use in our convolution um, operation. So the sampler is created we choose not to use normalized coordinates, uh, and we choose to use uh, clamp to edge for the case that if a pixel falls out of bounds, we will use the value of the border of the image. And we'll use uh, CL filter nearest to access the closest pixel to a coordinate uh, if the coordinates lies between. Now, this is the kernel function. So we have the kernel function name, convolution, which takes uh, input image, which is a 2D image object. The output image is a 2D uh, image object. And we have a constant uh, float filter, uh, which we'll use uh, to store the filter values. And then we provide the width of the filter and also the sampler object. Now this read only and write only are reserved keywords uh, that you can use to specify the properties of these uh, objects. And for the uh, filter, we know it's uh, going to be read only, so yeah, we declare it as a constant, which can then allow the uh, OpenCL runtime to uh, put these filter objects into the specific constant region in the global memory. In the body of this kernel function, the first several steps is to obtain the work item. Similarly, uh, we will use get global ID zero, get global ID one to uh, obtain these indices uh, at these two dimensions. Next, we're going to calculate the half width of the filter, uh, which will be used for uh, memory location indexing. Now the next line you see here is float for sum equals uh, brackets zero 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 zero. This is the first time we see a vector data type. Float for defines a four element vector of float types. So the sum is a vector with four floating point numbers, and it will assign the initial values to these four numbers with all zeros. The reason we want this is that uh, the way we operate the image data, 
is that we uh, will read the data items from the image object. It will actually return a vector of four uh, floating point numbers. So we can perform these uh, arithmetic operations on those floating point number vectors very easily using uh, this floating uh, this four element floating point vector. We'll see in the next slide. We'll uh, initialize the filter index and then we will um, declare a variable is uh, another vector this time is a for a two element integer uh, which is called uh, coordinates. This will be the coordinates for accessing the image um, object. Then we're going to iterate uh, through the filter rows. Remember, we're taking half width. So we're going to go from the kind of left side of the width and to the right side of the width, also uh, to the upper side of the um, filter, and also to the um, lower half of the filter. Uh, we look at you know the center pixel of that uh, filter. So we'll use coordinates.y to uh, record the current um, location of the pixel uh, in the whole picture, in the whole image, plus the uh, filter uh, location. Uh, this i is, a, as we said earlier, that it's an um, iteration variable that will track the individual pixels within the filter. And this another for loop is to iterate over the columns. So we have two dimensions. And similarly, we calculate uh, the coordinates of uh, the other dimension. Now, we declared pixel as a four element floating point vector because we're going to use this read image f to obtain the uh, pixel information from the image object. And the way we to do that is to supply uh, the image object, the sampler, which defines the uh, way we uh, want the image to be accessed uh, when there's a um, pixel uh, falling in the boundary or the coordinates are between pixels. And also we provide the coordinates. So after this function is returned and the pixel will be a, a vector of four and the uh, pixel information will be in this vector. Because at the time we create this image object, we said this is a single channel image, so only one of the four uh, elements in the vector represents the pixel value, and which is the x coordinate. So what we do here is we're going to use the actual value from the original image, multiply with the a pixel in a filter. And then we're going to uh, accumulate that to this sum.x. And every time we do this, uh, we will increase the filter index so we can move on to the next pixel in the filter. So overall, these uh, two for loops will go through every pixel in the filter, and we're going to uh, use the um, pixels of the neighboring, um, we're going to use the information of the neighboring pixels to multiply with the filter uh, pixel value, then do the accumulation. At the end, we will uh, use this write image app to store the updated pixel value in this output image. So we're going to use uh, this uh, image object, supply the uh, coordinates, and also provide the new pixel value for that coordinate. OK, so that was the uh, kernel. And assuming that the uh, kernel is completed successfully, then the next step is uh, to read the image back. So we'll use CL in Q read image because we know we uh, are dealing with the image uh, object. Uh, it's quite similar with in Q read buffer. Uh, so it takes the command Q as the first argument, the output image object, uh, CL true to indicate that we have to block this read uh, when this uh, read operation is completed, 
uh, we provide the original uh, origin and region parameters that we use for creating the image object. And then this is the uh, buffer on the host side that we use to store the image data. Now we see the demonstration. So we have a few files here. Um, we have a main.c uh, you have seen a lot of uh, similar headers included and also we have the input image um, what we see at this part of the code is that we define the different filters for example we define a blur filter and uh, these are the actual values we put into the filter and we define the uh, filter size, so the width is five. Uh, this is a sharpen filter, and the size is five. Uh, we also have a different filter uh, for the sharpen, uh, for edge sharpen, and that's a size of three. And we have a um, edge detection filter uh, with a um, size of five and we have a in-bross filter and so on. So those are all different filters you can use. And we have a filter list uh, which will help us to um, test out a specific filter that we're going to use in this example. Uh, in this case we want to test out the uh, edge detection. So I'm just uh, point out the important segments in this program. Uh, here, uh, based on the filter you selected, we will assign the uh, size of the filter and also uh, let this filter pointing out to the right uh, filter definition. Um, and then you can see that we uh, use the um, this helper function to initialize the filter values and also we use this helper function to read the BMP image data from the file and put it into uh, this host memory. Um, that's uh, H input image. For output we create the same size of the image uh, with the hope that we can read the uh, image back from the device to this host memory. And then we have this uh, code for platform for device uh, discovery. We have code for create context, command queue, and also build the program object and a kernel object. And this is where we create the images. Uh, it's similar to what we have saw in the previous uh, lecture slides. Uh, we define the image format, a single channel, the type is float and we create this 2D image. We also create the uh, output image object um, to store the result. We then create this uh, filter buffer. This filter buffer is uh, just a simple OpenCL buffer object. We supply the, uh, the type of the buffer and also the size. The next uh, 10, 20 lines are used for initializing these uh, input image object on the device and also the buffer object. So we define the origin and region and we use this write image to um, basically copy the uh, image data, the raw image data from this H input image that's a buffer on the host to this input image uh, object on the device side. We also do uh, copying uh, for, to move the buffer um, filter to the buffer on the device. So this is uh, what the inq write buffer does here. We now create the sampler. Uh, that's where we define how we're gonna uh, process the pixels that falls uh, out of the boundary also how we're going to apply the filters if the coordinates uh, is a fraction number that lies in between uh, some pixel coordinates. Next, we will set up the uh, kernel arguments. We'll provide the 
um, pointers to the input image and an op image object on the device will provide the filter buffer, will provide the uh, filter width, and also the sampler. Then we execute the kernel. You can see here we uh, set the global size as the columns and the width, the rows of the image, so that the whole picture is going to be processed. And then we use the local size 8 by 8. So this is going to be 8 work items in a group uh, in one dimension and also 8 in the other dimension. We'll now then do the CLNQ and the range kernel to launch the kernel. After the kernel is done, uh, the output image, this is an image object on the device, so we can read the output data back to the host using this CL uh, read image. So the output data will be eventually put into this H, uh, which stands for a host and output image buffer. Then we're going to call this uh, write BMP float. Uh, this is a helper function to store the uh, pixel data into a file and also create the necessary uh, file headers to, uh, for the BMP format. And we specify the size of the image as well. And we can use this uh, convolution gold float to actually perform the uh, filter on the host. And this is very useful for verifying the results that we get from the uh, FPGA or GPU device uh, through the OpenCL kernel. So we'll write the same, um, we'll write the results uh, to a file, but we name it differently. Uh, this will be a filtered reference. So this is kind of the uh, golden result that we should get. And of course, you can. Uh, do a, a verification by uh, comparing each of these values in those two buffers to see if there's uh, any significant difference. Ideally, these numbers will be identical uh, with a slight uh, you know, fraction of difference because of the floating point uh, computation. And eventually, we're going to free the resources on both the host side and also the open CL device side. So we'll compile the code. Uh, there are some warnings we need to um, you know, figure out. Uh, well, this is really the warning. That is to say the create image 2D is uh, kind of out of date uh, in the OpenCL 2.0, um, which is you know, not a big deal that we um, most of the time we'll work with 1.1 uh, or 1.x uh, OpenCL. And then we can run this. Um, so we can see there's output uh, created. The new filtered uh, image is created, and the file name is catfilter.bmp. Also, this message is printed out because uh, when we verify the output from the OpenCL kernel function with the golden result, um, everything matches. We can even uh, see the uh, generate the uh, BMP file. Uh, this is the folder we have the original image. Uh, that's the cat. Uh, if we can just look at here, this is the cat. Um, and we have the. This is the one we generate using by using the OpenCL kernel. So this is the edge detection, and this reference picture is the one we uh, obtained through the golden um, function uh, that actually uh, ran on the host side and we can see that visually these two pictures are the same so this uh, verifies the results 